All right, people, using the latest in technology, we are live on the electronic computer machine. I'm Dave Rubin, this is the Rubin Report, and it's Friday, so we've got another round table extravaganza for you. Joining me today is a columnist for the New York Post and Fox News, Carol Markowitz, and the politics editor at Chronicles Magazine and a sub-stack sub essayist for Contra, Pedro Gonzalez. Carol, Pedro, welcome to the Rubin Report. Hi, thanks for having us. Good to be here. Pedro, this is your tryout, first time Rubin Report person, and uh, you know it's, it's all dependent, your entire career is dependent on the next half hour. Are you ready? Well, I look forward to disappointing you like I disappoint my mother. So. <laughs> and Carol never disappoints anybody, so let's just dive right into it. Uh, the big sort of cultural story of the week was that uh, Elon Musk went after uh, Palpatine like George Soros. Uh, in an interview on CNBC after the Tesla shareholder meeting in Austin, Texas, uh, and then he continued it on Twitter. Uh, here's a bit of the interview from CNBC, because once you criticize George Soros, somehow you're automatically an anti-Semite or something like that. Here we go. How do you make a choice? You don't see, I mean, in terms of when you're going to engage. I mean, for example, even today, Elon, you, you, you tweeted this thing about George Soros. Well, I'm looking for it because I want to make sure I quote it properly. But I mean, you know what you wrote, but you basically. I said it reminds me of Magneto. This is like, you know, calm down, people. This is not like made a federal well, case you, out of it. You, also, you, know, <laughs> you said he wants to erode the very fabric of civilization and Soros hates humanity. Like when you do something like that. Do you yeah, think I think about, that's true. That's my opinion. OK, but why share it? Why share it? Especially, be, I mean, why share it when people who buy Teslas may not agree with you? Advertisers on Twitter may not agree with you. Um, why not just say, hey, I think this, you can tell me, we can talk about it over there, you can tell your friends, but why share it widely? I mean, uh, I, this is freedom of speech, I'm allowed to say what I want You wanted. absolutely are, but I'm trying to understand why you do, because you have to know it's got a, there, it, it puts you in, a, in the middle of a, the partisan divide in the country, it makes you a, a lightning rod for criticism. I mean, do you like that? I, you know, people today saying he's an anti-Semite. I don't think you are. No, I'm definitely, I'm, I'm like, I'm like a pro-Semite, <laughs> if anything. I'll say what I want to say, and if, 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 uh, if the consequence of that is losing money, so be it. I have to say, uh, you know, Elon had a bit of a weird week because he did hire this CEO from NBC Universal who seems like she might be kind of woke, and I, I keep trying to give him the benefit of the doubt. Uh, but, so let's put that one aside for a second. But his answer there, yeah, I think it's true. Mm -hmm. And that's my opinion. And the interviewer just does not want him to share his opinion. He even says it, why share it? Pedro, it's crazy that people share their opinions in America in 2023, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, and I think there's this kind of debate over, does Soros wake up every morning and do this kind of self-affirmation, like I will destabilize democracy? <laughs> I think that that debate is not really useful because we can actually just look at what he does and, mm -hmm. and what he accomplishes with his money and his influence. And so specifically the issue of, of Soros-backed prosecutors, district attorneys, right? So there are about 75 of these people in the United States. Now that sounds like a small number, but it's actually extremely consequential because those 75 people represent one in every five Americans or over 70 million people across half of the 50 most populous um, cities in, in the country. Uh, because these district attorneys, their jurisdictions are either counties or groups of counties, right? So with all of that under uh, under consideration, you're talking about a group of people who oversees 40% of homicides in this country. And so we can actually evaluate whether or not Soros is a good or bad guy when we look at these prosecutors and we see that they're doing things like not prosecuting violent offenders, letting people go, uh, implementing these these uh, trial policies and these plea deals and these these basically allowing people to get off for violent crimes with, with a kind of slap on the wrist. Um, we don't have to guess whether or not Soros is actually a bad guy. We can just look at what he's doing. I mean, think of, obviously, everyone is familiar with Alvin Bragg right now, but think about Larry Krasner in Philadelphia, mm -hmm. a guy who oversaw a historic uh, murder wave 
and th there's just been a, a, this a, attempt to uh, impeach him, but so far it's been unsuccessful. Like these people are deeply entrenched and they're only there because of Soros and his money. Right. And also we could mention George Gascon, who was the DA in San Francisco, who now, who wrecked San Francisco, now is wrecking LA as the DA and the guy that they impeached or they got rid of, recalled, uh, Chesa Bodine in San Francisco. Uh, Carol, this notion that somehow if you criticize Soros, you're an anti-Semite is so patently ridiculous. That would be like saying if you criticize Dave Chappelle, you're, you're anti-black, or if you criticize Anderson Cooper, you're anti-gay. Uh, actually, we have a tweet here from Amahai Chikli, he, and uh, he, he's in Israel's government. He wrote, as Israel's minister, who's entrusted on combating anti-Semitism, I would like to clarify that the Israeli government and the vast majority of Israeli citizens see Elon Musk as an amazing entrepreneur and role model. Criticism of Soros, who finances the most hostile organizations to the Jewish people in the state of Israel is anything but anti-Semitism, quite the opposite. So meanwhile, you've got an Israeli minister who this right. is his gig to make sure that people aren't hating the Jews. He's on the side of Elon Musk, but our entire leftist media machine is now calling Elon Musk an anti-Semite. That's it. It's first of all, I love Israelis. I love that. Like we love Elon, leave Elon alone. <laughs> um, just perfect. Um, I, you know, it's interesting because Soros isn't like doing this in the shadows. He had a Wall Street Journal piece about a year ago, last July, saying, hey, I fund these prosecutors and here's why. So this isn't like a conspiracy theory. He admits to this. And he has his reasons for it. And I think it's okay to criticize him and his reasons. And the thing that Elon is saying, that he's being destructive to civilization, this is true. We see this in the news. We watch this happen all the time. Tying it to Soros is showing, look, this is where the funding for these bad ideas comes from. And the fact that he's Jewish is such a side issue. Like, when does he ever talk about his Judaism? I mean, it's like, literally, I don't even associate him with Judaism at all. And if we can't criticize Jews, I don't know. I, I don't think anybody should be criticizing me or you because obviously that's anti-Semitic. <laughs> obviously. Uh, to, re to reiterate Pedro's point on that, here, here's what I tweeted out. Uh, the simplest way to look at it, uh, the simplest way to look at it, meaning this whole situation, is what DAs he's financially backed and what they subsequently did to Democrat-run cities. It's one yep. thing to be a misguided 20-year-old with good intentions. It's another to be his age with his track record and supposedly have them too. Point is, there is no legit rationale for his actions unless you want to upend Western democracies, which he's doing quite well. Look at his track record. Uh, and then I link to a Daily Mail piece over there. Uh, that has some of the numbers that you referenced, Pedro. Is there any version of Soros that we're not giving credit to? Is he just misguided? I hear a lot of people say, well, his intentions are good. He doesn't want people to rot in jail. So he sends them out onto the street. Right. Yeah, he just, he, he foists uh, rapists and murderers on us out of, out of the kindness of his heart. I actually, I, again, I don't, I can't read his mind. Uh, and there are other billionaires like him. There are other um philanthropists with, you know, quote, quote, uh, quotation marks around that word that are doing this. But Soros is just the most notorious. And I think it's just because he's, he's also probably the most prolific in the sense. Um, it, it, it's become like his elemental purpose to do this. Uh, but it's not just crime, obviously. It's also immigration. He mm -hmm. uses his money to basically hack political systems and, and bypass the rule of law. That's why countries like Hungary have passed Stop Soros Laws, mm -hmm. which are essentially intended to, to stop his money from being used to facilitate uh, mass immigration. Because again, that, that's a violation of a country's sovereignty. Countries and for the record, are... he was born in Hungary. That's mm -hmm. right, yeah, that's right. Um, no, I mean, you, you have a guy who, again, we can evaluate what he's actually doing, independent of the rhetoric, using words like democracy and openness and things like that. What is what? does Soros actually accomplish? He, he makes our quality of life worse. He gets people killed. He makes the United States a, a place where crime has become the norm and where we're not even allowed to comment on it anymore because it, it's, a, it's, it's considered a kind of anti-Semitism just by the fact that he's Jewish. Carol, um, Carol yeah. one last thought on this, just bringing it back to Elon for a second. Just doesn't it strike you as just deeply refreshing that not only is he willing to do these interviews? But the way he answers the questions where you can see he's thinking it through in real time, he's saying, hey, this is my opinion. And the fact that the, that the interviewer, it doesn't, I don't even know his name, it doesn't even matter, that he's so on the side of people self-censoring, which is probably the biggest problem that we have in America right now. 
Yeah, that interviewer would have no problem if Elon Musk was selling the opposite idea that we exactly, should defend exactly. George Soros, that it, criticizing George Soros is anti-Semitic. That interviewer will be cheering him on and talking about how he's talking truth to power. But instead, he's trying to shut down Elon's point of view. And Elon catches that. He, I, I really have a soft spot for him. Also, sidebar, but his new CEO follows me on Twitter. So how bad could she be? Um, <laughs> oh, I, right. I, you were I, on I, the I list when it came that out that she might be a kind of woke lefty. You were on the list of people that she followed. So people were kind of like, oh, she may not be that bad. And exactly. we'll see, we'll see. Right. I, I love Elon. I think that what, what he's doing is really refreshing. And I, I love seeing somebody just say what they think and not have to clear it with their PR team. So the other big story this week, obviously, was the Durham report coming out. Uh, let's just dive into it real quick. Uh, Daily Wire. Special Counsel John Durham, who was tasked by former Attorney General Bill Barr to examine the propriety of the FBI's investigation of President Trump, released a 320-page report on Monday that found the FBI had no evidence to support a Trump-Russia scandal when it began its investigation and found sobering differences in how it approached the Trump probe compared to other politically sensitive investigations. Pedro, am I some sort of uh, genius or person from the future in that I never fell for this thing and people could go back to all of my videos for the past six years and never find me buying what obviously was completely nonsensical? Yeah, no, and honestly, it, it, it's interesting because this this should be something that is like really sort of shocking, but it's not mm -hmm. for, for exactly that reason. It's like, this is not really news. And, and I think that's why there was there was this I think the maybe again I, I didn't see all of it, but it, it, that, that's the impression I got from the reaction to it. Was it was just kind of people, you know, sighing that like, yeah, we, we knew that. Um, but I guess the the reason I'm I haven't really gotten kind of, you know, in, in, uh, upset about it, I guess, is because I, I don't want to just get angry about this, about this attempt by the deep state to do whatever. I, I actually want accountability. And I think there's a problem now, and this is kind of an outsider uh, take on this issue, but the problem on the right is that we, I think we like just getting really angry about things and then never holding anybody accountable or getting serious enough to hold people accountable. And that's kind of where I'm at. It's like, yes, of course they did this. Of course it was wrong and unethical and horrible, but now what? I, I don't Carol, wanna just get angry about it. Yeah, is that really the issue? I mean, I say that on the show all the time. We can have hearings about everything. We can expose Twitter yeah. files, all of the stuff always. We can all turn out to be right three years later after being called right. conspiracy theorists. But to Pedro's point, nothing happens. I mean, that's what I kept thinking all week. All right, congratulations. We got the info that we thought. Yeah. Nobody's gonna get fired, doesn't matter. You know, I'm, I'm not gonna wait for big structural changes. I would love to see obviously accountability on a bigger level, um, but on a smaller level, I want everybody who fell for these hoaxes, every yeah. time that they say anything, I want the, us to say, you thought Donald Trump was a Russian spy. So just disqualify all of their future opinions. That's what they do to us. That's why Media Matters exists. It's so we they catch us saying something that's like wrong or inappropriate or whatever. And then they use that line to disqualify everything that we say going forward. I don't see why we don't do that to them. Have the list of people who said absolutely insane things about Donald Trump's connection to Russia and hold them accountable like that for the rest of their lives. So the other thing that happened this week, and it's sort of related to that, is there was a congressional hearing on the weaponization of government, and a couple FBI whistleblowers have come out. And what we're gonna play for you right now is unbelievably extraordinary. And again, the question is, will anything happen? Uh, basically a whistleblower saying, yeah, we can't release all, the, all those tapes that Tucker got because uh, we were pretty much in on it. Take a look. Those individuals were inside the Capitol, to which the SSA responded back, and I was privy to these conversations firsthand, why can't you show us, why can't you just send us, the, give us access to the 11,000 hours of video of this exam, that's available? Because there may be, may be, UCs, undercover officers, or CHS's confidential human, for, confidential human sources on those videos whose identity we need to protect. So Mr. Allen, you got retired. Oh, hot damn, it turns out there were a whole bunch of undercover FBI agents on top of the fact that we saw police officers moving barricades, opening doors for people, welcoming, welcoming them into the Capitol. Uh, again, Pedro, I have a feeling I know your opinion on this. Uh, you're not shocked and you don't think anything's gonna happen. 
Yeah, I, I actually, my opinion is probably even worse than than what you had hoped. And that's basically, again, this is a situation where I'm I'm really sick of of just getting angry about things and never holding anybody accountable. And I think this revolves around the whole stolen election narrative. And I've basically come to the position that look, the election wasn't stolen; it was given away. And we now have these reports that are coming out in places like the Washington Post. And by the way, the liberal media is good now, right? Because you know we've we've got people like Donald Trump saying that. Um, <laughs> right. The so well, the liberal media reported that the Trump campaign actually hired two different teams to investigate the, the integrity of the results in 2020. And at least one of those teams concluded that the Trump campaign hired. At least one of those teams concluded before the January 6 stuff, before the rally was held, that the devolved into. You know, this what you could argue was a situation where, where there were undercover uh, federal agents who are maybe probably goading uh, people to doing things that ultimately got them in jail. Well, before that even happened, the Trump campaign was made aware by the people it hired that they could not find enough fraud to argue that the, the election had been swung in some way for Biden. Now, I think Democrats did do things that were unethical, uh, but they but I think that's not a surprise. Everyone before the 2020 election happened knew that Democrats were going to do something, whether it was ballot harvesting or lawfare or whatever, and they did. But there was no countermeasures taken. And, and so basically you had the situation where the Trump campaign internally knew that basically Democrats had just outfoxed them because they wanted to win more. And that's ultimately what matters, right? Who's in the White House? Mm -hmm. And still held this rally that devolved into a situation where you it looks like you had undercover federal agents that were helping this thing turn into an out of control riot and that's why i can't just participate in this this ridiculous kind of endless thing of outrage and i mean in the background of all this donald trump just defended hiring christopher ray and it, and his defense was well chris christie and the democrats told me yep. it was a good yep. idea he can't bring himself to say it was a mistake to put someone like Christopher Ray in charge of the FBI at the same time that we're supposed to get angry at the FBI for hanging uh, undercovers uh, at January 6th. I mean, it's not my, obviously my position is not the one a lot of people want to hear, but it, it's just really hard to get angry and, and just participate in this outrage machine when you have all of these other facts to, uh, to consider. Well, because kind of what you're saying there is that Trump was sort of in on it and that he knew they weren't going to reverse the results of the election and he internally knew that he had lost, but he still set up the people. And to some degree, he had to know that there were going to be agents in there. I mean, again, this is one of those things that on January 6th, as it was happening, I was like, this does not seem legit. They are moving barricades, literally welcoming them yep. into the people's house. Carol. Yeah. I have a friend who went to this um, on January 6th to cover it as a reporter. And what they say is they're like, when I go to a July 4th parade at the nation's capital, there are police every five feet. Here, there was nothing. Mm -hmm. And they were like, we're out of here and le left the event. Um, I, I think that that's really the thing is that we all kind of know that it was definitely you know not what we saw on television um but there are not going to be any consequences to this and the whistleblower report like has barely been mentioned even in the news it's like that doesn't even exist the, the the testimony of the whistleblowers is something that nobody's being paying any attention to it's disheartening because i like to think of myself as very like i believe in america i believe in our systems i believe in our you know institutions and just the failure at every level for the last few years has to be disheartening and i i see people opting out of public life mm -hmm. uh, opting out of like even social life um, because they have such a negative opinion of what's going on with our institutions i i don't know that they could be rebuilt maybe that that's just impossible but I, I would love to see a country where we trust institutions again. Pedro, what about how this over time will just degrade these institutions completely? Because if you're a young person that might want to work at the FBI or the CIA and you're watching these hearings right now, you're probably, if, if you're a true patriot, if you believe in America, believe in the institutions, as Carol's saying, how could you, how could you take that job? <sighs> Yeah, I think, well, you're, you're already seeing this across basically every institution like that. I mean, like the military is having awful recruitment problems and it's, it's you know, it's hard to figure out why the military is having a hard time getting people to sign up to die for this, for exactly what we're discussing. Basically, a system that's run by people that hate everyday Americans. Mm -hmm. Th that's what you're supposed to give your life for. That's what you're supposed to put everything on the line for. 
Um, so yeah, I mean, w I think we're we're witnessing a kind of the the free fall of institutional credibility in the United States, and that's really difficult to to fix. Um, it certainly requires better and more capable leadership, but again, th this is something that's been a long time coming, and it's not going to be fixed overnight. Uh, this is, I think, the beginning of a kind of long and sad decline for institutional credibility. I want to just add that I keep meeting Donald Trump supporters who are not planning to vote because they no longer believe that our elections are worth anything. Um, these are older people who have voted in every election. Um, they want Donald Trump to win and they're not planning to vote. So you know who we're shooting ourselves in the face? I mean, this is this is what's happening on the right. Yeah, well, all right, so to that point, let's talk a little bit about uh, this upcoming election because it does sound like our fair governor, Carol, uh, Ron DeSantis is gonna jump in probably in the next couple of days. Got a little info here from your paper, the New York Post. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis will officially enter the race for president next week, the Post has learned, setting up a much anticipated face-off with his one-time ally, former President Donald Trump. After months of speculation about a White House run, DeSantis 44 will fire the required paperwork with the Federal Election Commission before holding an announcement event in his hometown of Dunedin, according to Sunshine, a Sunshine State legislative source. The prospective filing coincides with a two-day meeting between DeSantis and his donors in Miami, where attendees are being told they'll be put to work. The source added that DeSantis's official announcement will be followed by a staggered rollout of endorsements that have been held in reserve until he gets in the race. The DeSantis supporting Never Back Down PAC previously announced the Florida governor has been endorsed by dozens of legislator, legislatures uh, in early voting states of Iowa and New Hampshire. Uh, Pedro, the first part I wanna mention about that is the 44. He is 44 years old. I am 46 years old. That means I'm older than him. We are used to be governed, uh, being governed by, you know, people in their late 70s, 80s, and, and sometimes in their 90s. Uh, it's kind of refreshing, isn't it? Yeah, that was my first thought, actually, when I was looking at that screen grab was 44. Um, it, it, it's just so funny because uh, this DeSantis is, DeSantis is basically the, the exact opposite of, of what both Joe Biden and Trump represent uh, th this kind of, um, and I mean, we're going to get into this, but and part of it is precisely that DeSantis is being framed as a kind of Trojan horse by by uh, the Trump campaign. Um, but right now you've got this kind of funny situation where Trump, who's supposed to be the anti-establishment guy, is actually in many ways kind of legitimizing the old sclerotic GOP establishment and its ideas. And on the other hand, you've got this young upstart that actually threatens to kind of upset the apple cart. And that's, I mean, that seems to me pretty obvious why he's so hated by the, I mean, the actual established uh, GOP, which has fallen in line behind Trump. I mean, it, it's a, it's an incredible situation because of the level of gaslighting that's gone in to convince you that DeSantis represents the old order. Uh, and, and these two older guys, or, or I guess specifically Trump represents the new order. Uh, a version of that, as I keep saying, would be that Trump is on the side of the mainstream media at this point. He did a CNN town hall, despite the fact he'll tell you CNN is evil, and he's literally posting links to Joy Reid's website, <laughs> MSNBC Joy Reid, noted racist from MSNBC Joy Reid, on, on his Truth Social account. Uh, Carol, look, you very publicly, we got here the same week to Florida. Uh, you came from New York, I came from Cali. Uh, you've seen the good life here for a year and a half. I take it you're pleased about what's about to happen. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, you know, I, I walk around smiling. But look, I, I can't make any decisions about 2024 until I hear what Kristen Nunu is gonna be doing and Chris Christie. <laughs> yeah, like I have to see, are they running? Or what's going on yeah. with that? Yeah. Um, I really well, hope Chris Christie's not running, I promise you that. I hope Sununu, Christie, and DeSantis announce in the same day so that the other two can see that there's only one person actually in this race and, and really they, they don't belong in it. Um, I, I think that what DeSantis has done in Florida has been revolutionary. I feel like we're in a revolution down here. We're seeing things from our government that I just never expected to see. I Things like, you know, I was in my son's public school classroom today. I'm like, it is a classic 
classroom where not a single piece of nonsense on any of the walls, not a single like trans flag or BLM sign or any of it. And I know I came from Brooklyn and, and Brooklyn's crazy, but I'm so used to um, mm -hmm. just being on guard and like thinking like I'm going to look around and see something I don't like. And, you know, the worst thing about it was there was a Taylor, Taylor Swift poster, but I think we can live with that. And the normalcy here and just the way that that DeSantis promotes the, that, that normalcy is amazing. Well, that's the incredible thing to me because they're trying to frame normalcy and competency and decency as radicalism or somehow this right wing lunacy. And it's just not true. Thanks. Carol, I want to play a clip. Uh, you were on Jordan Peterson's podcast uh, about a week ago and you guys got into why it's important to fight the culture wars and why certain people don't and why certain people do. I think that's yeah. definitely related to what's going on here in Florida. Take a look. Conservatives are so damn blind that this goes on under their noses constantly, and they often facilitate its movement forward. And it's because they're, they're either ignorant, that's part of the problem, or they're afraid on the moral front, and neither of those are excusable, especially when hypothetically they're concerned about losing the cultural war, which they are definitely losing. Well, look at the abuse and pushback that Governor DeSantis gets, even from other Republicans. You know, people that are in the public eye, the the Chris Christie's of the world and such, they say things like he, DeSantis sparks cultural wars. Well, cultural wars are really important because a war for the culture matters. Culture matters. So yes, we should be fighting these wars. I think so much of what we talk about is um, dismissed by the left and we let them dismiss it. We let them say, oh, this doesn't matter, but it does matter. And we should be talking about it all the time. I think that the schools and the fight for our schools is so important. Pedro, to, to Carol's point and to Jordan's point, MSNBC right now and Donald Trump and Mike Pence and Chris Christie and Nikki Haley are all on the same side of Disney against DeSantis right now, all DeSantis did was even the playing field. He got rid of crony capitalism, which apparently the leftists yeah. and now Trump are for. It's, it's incredible, actually. Yeah, it's it, not only incredible, but it, it, it's also, in order to do this, Trump has to repudiate his own position as, as the culture warrior, right? The one who is saving us from the extremes of the left. He's now rooting for Disney. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's that's problematic for two reasons. One, like you, and this is the point that I actually keep highlighting uh, because I think it's it's powerful and it cuts across both aisles. And that's that really this is this is as much it is a culture war thing, obviously. Like Disney was pushing these radical ideas um, on, on kids through their programming, but it's also a question of who rules. Are corporations above any accountability? Right. Do they get to say, do, do, right. do they get to do whatever they want? Because I, th I think you have to go back here and remember that this started with the, um, the the Parental Rights and Education Act, right? Which was really popular in Florida for obvious reasons. And Disney was not happy with it and basically said, you know, we don't care that Floridians like this bill uh, that protects families from, from the extremes of the left. We're going to do everything in our power to 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 kill it. And if it passes, we're going to we're going to basically engage in economic warfare against politicians by by withholding donations from from people that have basically been instrumental to Disney's success. Right. So there's no kind of there's no sense of humility from the company. And so DeSantis said, no, actually, corporations don't get to do whatever they want. Floridians are actually in charge of their own state. And Disney doesn't get to push around the, the entire state government. And I think, I think when you frame it like that, what Trump and Haley and Pence are doing becomes even more disgusting. They're siding with a corporation that basically has said, like, we rule, not you, the people of Florida. Right, or and, the, and the funny do. part, the interesting part is, so DeSantis is going against the corporations. I thought the left hated corporations. He's going right. against the donor class, which is not happy. Yeah. I thought politicians right. weren't supposed right. to be owned by donors. And he went from winning his first election by 30,000 votes to 1.6 million. So he's clearly doing what the people want, Carol. Right, there was a Nikki Haley quote where she said something like, he's such a hypocrite because he took money from Disney and he's fighting them anyway. It's like, yeah, he took money from Disney and he's fighting them anyway. It's amazing. Yes. You should do yeah. that. You should try that, you know? Um, also, uh, the other Nikki Haley line, I, and you know, I actually, I quite like Nikki. I have nothing against her, um, but I think that she's gotten into a battle here that makes no sense. And, it, and and not just her, obviously, you know, all the other people, Donald Trump, Mike Pence, Chris Christie. I think that the fight that they're fighting is just 
makes no sense to me. Obviously, they should be on DeSantis' side, but she said something like, oh, Disney should move Disney World to South Carolina. The thing that worries me about that is, like, do you really have no concept of how hard it would be to move Disney World? Do you not know that, that, that this enormous thing exists that, like, with buildings and communities and all sorts of stuff around it? Like, do you think we're throwing it on the back of a pickup truck and driving it over to South Carolina? <laughs> Can you be president when you don't know stuff like that? I, I'm not so sure. Well, also is the implication, and again, I, I like Nikki too, personally and, and professionally, mm -hmm. but is the implication, oh, you will then give them special benefits in right. South Carolina that you won't give other companies because right. that's, all, that's all he took away. Uh, but speaking of DeSantis and just, just basically just doing what's right, it doesn't have to be packaged. Yep. In, in anything that fancy, here he is yesterday on, uh, you know, that we are not gonna be transing these kids. I mean, if you're taking off the private parts of some 15 year old kid, you know, you should go to jail for that. Uh, this is just totally unacceptable. One of the things we did in that bill, though, is we're giving the victims the ability to sue the physicians. So if you've gone through this as a 16 year old or a 15 year old, now you're 24, 25 and you have all this irreversible damage, you bring suit against them because they violated the Hippocratic Oath they put their ideology ahead of evidence-based medicine. Pedro, everyone knows this is right. E yeah. Everyone knows it. People are afraid to say it, but everyone knows this should not be being done to children. It really is as simple as that. I think, I think you should ask yourself, uh, David, what would a rhino do differently than what DeSantis is doing? Like that's that's right. the level of the discourse right now, right? There, it's funny because there there are simultaneously there are two different attacks on DeSantis right now. One is that he's beholden to big money, and that's bad for him. And the second one is that his his fights with Disney, and his willingness to actually believe in things, uh, is going to hurt his support with donors, and that's bad for him. Th these both of these lines of attack are being used at the same time against DeSantis. There was a story in the Financial Times about some big uh, donor who said that he was really turned off by the fact that DeSantis, this DeSantis guy actually seems to believe in the things that he fights for, in mm. particular cultural and social issues. And I don't like that. That makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> and, and the Trump people were sharing it like it was like, man, this is, this is proof that the, the donors are turning on him. And the next day it's like, you know, this guy is a real Trojan horse. He's controlled entirely by the donors that yesterday, you know, you said he, there, uh, he was pissing off because he's willing to actually take on these fights. I mean, it's insane. Uh, but it, I think it also just shows that despite all the rhetoric that's coming out of the Trump campaign, because that's ultimately what this is about, right? Um, they're, they're deeply intimidated by him. Despite the, the talk about national polls, which are, I think, are, uh, irrelevant at this point, at this, this early uh, in, in, in the race, I guess, um, I think they're afraid of him. They're, you don't act like this. You don't talk about the guy every single day. You don't attack him from every conceivable angle, even when they contradict, unless you're actually intimidated by the guy and you think that he poses a real threat to you. Well, to that point, I wanna show you this ad that I saw literally about a half hour before we started the show. This is a, a Donald Trump ad. So he posted this himself on Instagram and we've got DeSantis doing all of the things he set out to do one at a time, just knocking down dominoes. You may not agree with all of them. I personally disagree with what he did moving up abortion from 15 weeks to six. That's a personal disagreement I have and that's fine. But he's accomplishing everything he set out to do, donors be damned. Here's what Trump put up this morning and just see if you think there's a little difference in tone and direction and the rest of it. Ron DeSantis was struggling big time in his primary race for governor of Florida. Polls revealed DeSantis was failing so bad, he was losing by a staggering 17 points. Then DeSantis was saved by the endorsement of President Trump. Trump's support was so powerful, just two days after the endorsement, DeSantis took a commanding lead and it propelled him to being elected governor. I'd like to thank our president for standing by me when it wasn't necessarily the smart thing to do. You're welcome, Ron. Unfortunately, instead of being grateful, DeSantis is now attacking the very man who saved his career. Isn't it time DeSantis remembers how he got to where he is? Make America great again. Big league, so good. Build the wall. Then Mr. Trump said, you're fired. I love that part. Truth is, there's only one person who can make America great again. Carol, I wanna give the devil his due here. Trump did help DeSantis become governor first time around. He endorsed him and helped him. There's no doubt about it. 
I also voted for Trump last time. I'm pretty sure both of you did too. Um, but this thing where he has to be grateful, there's no message there. There's no reason to vote for Trump there. It's that you're scared of DeSantis and should DeSantis just bow forever? I, I just don't think it works. I don't understand the whole argument from the Trump campaign. And I wrote this in a, a piece a few weeks ago about this, but you know, the argument that DeSantis is this horrible globalist, you know, rhino donor shill. Also, I want full credit for his governorship. Like, which is <laughs> and he should just wait true. four years. Yeah. Right? And, and he should wait and then we'll support him then because then it'll be okay to support this globalist shill. Um, and look, the Trump campaign is clearly afraid of Ron DeSantis. The media is clearly afraid of Ron DeSantis. I don't blame them. I really see something in him that I don't see in a lot of politicians. He is a juggernaut. He is this revolutionary character where he is making some serious changes. And the people who oppose him should be worried because I don't see him losing on a lot of fronts. Um, it doesn't mean that'll never happen. It doesn't mean that you know DeSantis is gonna run away with this nomination. I think Donald Trump is a formidable opponent and it will be an uphill climb. Um, but the idea that the Trump campaign is not worried about him is just not jiving with the reality of the way that they're behaving. No, and I, you know, I, I don't know if Pedro's going to get into this, but the comments on that article, on that video, are just all pro DeSantis. Here, let me let me actually show you. We have a screen capture. So they disabled, they limited the comments right after putting this up. Within about ten or fifteen minutes, all of the comments uh, were negative and defending DeSantis and going after Trump and you know basically saying this isn't working and this is nonsense and you've got to you know, there's a case to be made for Trump. Yep. He refuses to make it. So as you can see on the bottom there, I actually, I can't quite see it on the screen. It says that they're limited or something to that effect. So that's from the yeah. Trump account. Uh, that's from team Trump himself. Uh, Pedro, he, he's not making a case for himself. He's trying to make an anti case, but. Yeah, yeah. no, that's right. And by the way, the same thing happened when uh, Donald Trump Jr. took a kind of very similar line of attack against DeSantis and, and posted it on Instagram. Oh yeah, they the did the same thing. thing. Yeah, and I, I actually uploaded it to Twitter, just scrolling through an endless stream of negative comments, people either outright, you know, attacking him for what he said or saying, I support both people. I don't understand why Trump, you know, I, I don't understand why you guys are attacking DeSantis. But they were overwhelmingly negative. And it's interesting because, uh, again, this this just seems to be a kind of social media phenomenon that kind of DeSantis is over and he's a traitor and stuff. Um, it, it's It's mostly on Twitter. Uh, because we've also seen this live, right? When Trump at rallies tries to attack DeSantis, the audience goes silent. Yeah. yeah. And even on Instagram, it doesn't work. It's basically just Truth Social and Twitter, which on the one hand, Truth Social is the Trump platform. And on the other hand, it's easy to manipulate Twitter. Uh, you know, there's this, there's this article, and this, this is not, you know, I'm not talking about Russian bots, but there was an article that I think correctly pointed out that there actually does seem to be um, th this kind of organized social media effort, specifically on Twitter, to generate what looks like overwhelming support. Uh, like I, I, I notice that whenever I tweet about um, DeSantis or Trump, I get instant negative replies from like low follower accounts. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very bizarre. But then when you do the same exact content on Instagram, it's just real people who are saying, this is ridiculous, knock it off. Mm -hmm. And it's fascinating. And I think that the, the point that you're making about how basically Trump is running on, it's, uh, I'm owed something. I'm sorry, that's loser talk. Losers talk about what they're owed. And this whole thing of like, I made DeSantis, all me. Trump oversaw losses in 2018, 2020, and 2022. DeSantis, you know, you could say with the help of Trump, turned a win into a bigger win and delivered for his constituents. What did Trump do with, with the electoral capital that Americans gave him? He pushed a jailbreak legislation. Um, he pushed amnesty. He was bragging about amnesty. I mean, think back to like the Breitbart headlines, Amnesty Dawn. Trump bragging about pushing a bigger amnesty than anything Obama had considered. And that was being pushed even to the end of his administration, and there was talk internally about doing it either at the end of his first administration or early in the second administration. I, I think yeah. that's really important. And by the way, in order to attack the, because Trump knows this is all true, by the way, and in order to attack you know, the, the uh, image of DeSantis as a winner, because he is, Trump recently pointed out that DeSantis also endorsed Kerry Lake, who yeah. is a loser. <laughs> in other words, Trump, too, Trump tossed Kerry Lake under the bus to so take bad. a shot at DeSantis. 
And by the way, he did the same thing two weeks ago when he got those 12 Florida legislators to come to Mar-a-Lago to endorse him. The next morning, he put out this insane anti-Florida diatribe, yep. basically making them all look like fools. Several people who I like a lot, including Byron Donalds. It's like, what? Like, he just threw you under the bus, dude. Carol, am I, am I crazy? But I do think there's, a, there's an out here. And the out here would be that over the next couple of weeks as DeSantis gains momentum and people are just like, you know what? This is the competent guy. He's younger. It's a real team. It's no mm-hmm. circus. It's what everyone said that they wanted out of Trump. It's, it's serious policy without the crazy tweets and all that. That Trump might, like if, if, if anyone on Trump's team is watching this, like the out that still makes you the hero here is just to be like, you know what? I have sciatica, I twisted my ankle, I can't do it. And, but there is a guy that's pretty good. And I've gone a little harsh on him, but actually I take it back because my family and me and all my grandchildren live in his state. Many of them moved here because of him during COVID. And let's do this together and let's save America. It's like, there's such a nice ending that's so obvious here, but can he take it? Can he take it? There's no way he'll take it. I, I thought that there was no reason for Donald Trump to run this time. I, I you know, I, I had met him at Mar-a-Lago. He seemed like his life was going fantastically after, you know, after leaving the White House. He, his life just seemed so much better. He was so much calmer, happier. Um, and I, I kept thinking, like, this guy could be kingmaker. He can be that role that he thinks he played for Ron DeSantis. He could literally come into races and be like, yep. this is my guy. And, and that guy can go on to win and he can he can play that role for so many different candidates potentially. Um, but instead he decided, no, he needs, he has scores to settle and he, he wants to run again. From my perspective, this run makes no sense, but look, he, he wants to do it again. Like that's fine. Um, I, I would also say that the way that the media is going after DeSantis, they're really treating him like the front runner. The piece in mm-hmm. political today where they really go hard against um, Casey DeSantis, getting quotes from like Roger Stone about how she's Lady Macbeth. And then this this writer goes on for several paragraphs about how the comparison actually does fit. Um, and it just, I, I find it all so disgusting, but the, the fact is that they're doing this to DeSantis and not Trump right now. And there's a reason for that. Yeah, I've, I've been saying it for weeks. Everybody's going after DeSantis. MSNBC and Trump are on the same time, uh, on the yep. same side. Pedro, first appearance, last word. Yeah, well, I, I, I could not help but notice the, the, the hilarity of Politico basically observing a healthy marriage uh, between Casey and Ron DeSantis, <laughs> and then basically writing an article about why it's problematic, and then quoting, uh, getting a comment from Roger Stone for that story. Stone, a guy who has uh, allegedly been very active in swinger circles and put out ads asking for men to sleep with his wife. Uh, but I think that the issue is is that the 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 enemy of the people, to use the Trump uh, to use the term that Trump coined about the media, is actually in the tank with Trump against DeSantis yep. because they know that he's actually a far greater threat to them. And he also won't give them access. He won't give Maggie Haberman yeah. exclusive interviews on demand and they hate him for it. Yeah, that's absolutely right. He said to MSNBC, you lie about me constantly. We're not gonna do this anymore. However, I will continue to do this with you guys. I've enjoyed it. Thank you, Pedro, for your first appearance. Carol, you're welcome back anytime. And Thank you. Uh, we've got a post game show in about 37 seconds at rubinreport.locals.com. Everybody else have a great weekend. We'll be back on Monday.